So one of the things that you guys are learning this week are um, is solving quadratic equations and all the different ways that you can solve a quadratic equation. And one of the ways you can solve them is by using the square root property. So that's what we're going to get into today. So the square root property comes from the definition of a square root. So when you take the square root of a number, the definition is that it is the absolute value of the number. Basically, you get the positive. Because you take the square root of 4, we get 2. Uh, but technically, if we had the square root of like negative 2 squared, the square root cancels out the square. You have another answer as well that could be negative 2 because negative 2 squared also gives you 4. You've got 2 squared, that's 4, and negative 2 squared, that's 4. When we take square roots with numbers, we always assume that it's the positive answer. We don't use the negative answer. This changes when we start solving. So when we start solving quadratics where there are two answers, we have both the positive and the negative answer. So like if we have um, x squared equal to 4, then you take the square root of both sides, essentially. So um, whatever we do to the left, we do to the right when we're solving. You can add the same thing on both sides. You can multiply that both sides. You can also do the square root of both sides. And so the square root of 4 is 2. But we can also get an answer of negative 2 because negative 2 squared gives you 4. So there's two possible answers that we'll get when we're solving. Um, when we're taking square roots with numbers without a variable, so when there's no variable involved, we just always assume the positive. Otherwise, we write both. And so sometimes instead of writing two separate answers with x equals 2 or x equals negative 2, we combine them into one answer with this plus or minus symbol. This is read as plus or minus. And it just means you have the positive version and the negative version. You've got two of those solutions. So we've just combined them into one shortcut. So that's what that symbol means. And when you're asked to give the solution set, which is usually how it's worded in Alex, that means you're going to have it in curly braces. And so you can either write plus or minus the number, or you write your two numbers with commas. Uh, separate one the positive and one the negative. So the key here, the square root property is basically allowing us to solve an equation by taking the square root of both sides. But when we do that, we get two possible answers. And so we're going to end up with two equations that we will then continue to solve. So you can't use this rule in every case. So uh, the square root property is really easy to use, but unfortunately it doesn't work for every equation. It only works when they're in certain forms. And so these are the, the, the forms that you can solve using the square root property. So when you're solving a quadratic equation, well, if you're asked to solve an equation first, you need to identify is it a linear equation or quadratic, and quadratic have an exponent of 2. And then once you've identified as quadratic, you need to identify which form it is so you know the best way to solve. And if it's in one of any of these forms that are listed here, then solve using the square root property because that is going to be the easiest way to solve. So if you just have something squared equals a number or something squared plus a number equals zero, you could have your squared part in parentheses. And so that could be either equal to zero or equal to a number or have a number added on and that's equal to zero. You can also have a perfect square trinomial equal to a number and then you can factor it first and then solve using the quadratic or, or using the square root property. So when you were learning factoring last week, one of the special cases is the perfect square trinomial. And if you recognize you have a perfect square trinomial, you can factor it into its squared form, and then you can use the square root property. 
So these are the when you will use the square root property. How do you use the square root property? Basically, what are the steps? So first, if you have the perfect square trinomial situation, you need to factor it. So if you don't have that, you can skip step one. Step two is to rewrite your equation so that the squared part is by itself. So if you have any numbers added on, you can move the number to the other side so you just have something squared equals a number. Then you're going to take the square root of both sides. And then that's going to give you a plus or minus answer and that you're going to rewrite it as two separate equations to continue solving because sometimes you don't get the same number you won't get like plus or minus two you might as you solve get two and maybe like negative seven you might have two separate numbers so you need to write them as two separate equations and then you solve each of those equations and those are going to be linear equations that you're solving and just a tip here, if you watched my video from last week on factoring by substitution, you can also solve by substitution if you do substitution for if you have these parts in parentheses. So that instead of solving for like x plus b, you can be solving for u. And it can make it look easier. But you have to remember to then back substitute back in what you had so that you can finish solving. But that is, that is an option that you can do. So I'm going to just start off with the simple cases of solving by taking square roots, and then we'll go into the more complicated cases. So these are the two easiest situations that you may need to solve and that you can use the, this method. So the first one You've got the form where you have something squared equals a number. The second one, we have something squared plus, or in this case, minus a number equals zero. So those are the first two situations when I go to the, the list here. We just don't have a number in front of the x squared. It's one. But the, these fit in the first two forms where we can use the square root property. And these are really quick for solving a lot of times you can actually kind of do these in your head, though I recommend writing down your steps. So we've got on the left, t squared equals 144, and I'm going to just rewrite it so that I can show my steps here. So step one would be if you have a perfect square trinomial factor, we don't need to do that. We can skip step one. Step two would be to rewrite it so you have the square root or the squared part by itself. We're already in that form, so we can skip step two. So step three is to take the square root of both sides. So we're going to take the square root of both sides. And so I recommend doing some sort of color coding so that you can show that, so you can see that it's different from the original equation. And when you take a square root of something squared, those just cancel out. And so you're just left with t, because the square root cancels out an exponent of 2. And then you always get a plus or minus. And then we have our square root of 144. And so then we want to simplify by actually taking the square root of 144, which in this case is 12. So we get plus or minus 12. So we've got t by itself, so we don't really need to do anything else. That's our final answer. So you can write your solution set with the curly braces as plus or minus 12, or you can write your solution as 12 comma negative 12, because we have two answers. You always have two answers. So we've got the positive version of 12 and the negative version of 12. I got a question once from a student asking, well, how do I know if they want me to write both answers or not just one? You always write both answers. You're never going to have just one number here unless you're taking the square root of zero, which is a very rare situation. So if you get two answers, a positive and negative, you write both answers.
Now, this example on the right here, we have k squared minus 7. So we need to actually get the square root by itself first before we do anything else. So get, or not, I keep saying square root, get the squared part. Square by itself. So what that means is that the plus 7, which is on the same side as the square, I need to put it on the right side. So it's minus 7, so I'm going to add 7 to both sides. And this gives me k squared equals 7. Now that you've got your square by itself, now you're going to take the square root of both sides. So I'm just writing that down, and I recommend that you always write that down as well. And so I can just kind of color code that and do it in a different color to indicate that I'm taking the square root. And that will cancel out my square, so I'm left with k. And then we get plus or minus, and then the square root of 7. So you, you want to try to simplify further. The square root is 7. If you do that on your calculator, it's a decimal. We're not going to write the decimal numbers unless the problem specifically states it. We're going to leave it in its square root form. If you've got a number underneath the square root that's not a prime number, then you can simplify it further by following the rules of simplifying radicals. 7 is prime, so this is as simple as it can get. So we can write our answer as plus or minus the square root of 7, or you can write it as the square root of 7, comma, negative square root of 7. When you write your, type your answers into Alex, if you use the form with the comma, be very careful to make sure your comma is not inside the square root. So you need to make sure that you hit your arrow key so that your, your cursor is outside of the square root before you hit the comma, because otherwise it's going to be marked wrong. So you just want to make sure that you're outside of the square root symbol before you hit the comma, before you hit the minus, and do your second answer. Are there any questions on either of these two examples? Okay. Oops, I want too many slides. Okay, so here are two more examples, and now I've thrown a number in front of your squared term so that you can see, okay, I'm adding in an extra step here. So on the left, I've got 4t squared equals 81. We want to get the t squared by itself. We need to get rid of the 4 in front. So we're going to follow the same rules when we're solving uh, a linear equation where we need to divide both sides by 4. And we have to do that first before we take the square root. We could take the square root at this point, but it's usually harder and more confusing if you do it now, so it's better to do it after you've got the squared part by itself. So we're going to get the squared or the square by itself. And so I'm going to divide both sides by Four. And so that gives me, oh, let's just do this in yellow. So that would give me t squared on the left, and then 81 divided by 4 does not divide evenly. 81 doesn't, 4 doesn't go into 81. So you're going to leave it as a fraction, and you would try to reduce it if possible. In this case, these don't reduce. So we've got our um, square by itself, and now we're going to take the square root of both sides. And 
I'm sure you guys can hear my dog barking. Normally, I would be trying to get more interaction here, but with my dog barking, I'm going to try to just see how, how much I can get through as quickly as possible, but not too fast, because clearly she is unhappy. Um, so take the square to both sides. So I'm going to indicate that. And so that gives us a t squared and then a whoops equals a plus or minus because we have two answers here. One of the most common things that I've uh, errors I've seen are people forgetting the plus or minus. So we get a plus or minus and then the square root of 81 over 4. And now we need to actually simplify that square root. So when you're simplifying a fraction with the square root, you can do the square root of the top over the square root of the bottom. So this will give us, oops, and this isn't t squared, it's just t, sorry. Um, so we get t equals plus or minus. So the square root of 81 is 9, and the square root of 4 is 2. So we get plus or minus 9 halves as our solution. And so... I'm going to just write it as the plus or minus version here because it, it's quicker, less to write. And um, in Alex, there will be a plus or minus button that you can pick if they're allowing you to enter it this way. If the plus or minus button is not there, then you need to write it as the two numbers uh, separated by a comma. So look at the buttons and what they give you because that will tell you how you're kind of typing in your answer. So 3v squared plus 33. So here we need to get the v squared by itself first. So see that the first step is always the same here, basically. Get the square by itself. So always do your addition and subtraction first before you do anything else. So we are going to, we need to move the 33 to the other side. So it's plus, so we're going to subtract 33 from both sides, which gives us 3 of v squared equals a negative 33. Then we, we're still trying to get the v squared by itself because we need to get rid of the V that's in front. So we're going to divide both sides by three. So then that gives us V squared equals negative 11. So now we've gotten the square by itself and we need to take the square root of both sides. And you notice we got a negative, so we're going to get an imaginary answer out here. So we're gonna take the square root of both sides. So I'm just going to indicate that. And so I've got V on the left, taking the square root, the square cancels. I still get a plus or minus, and then we have the square root of negative 11. So when you have the square root of a negative, that negative always gets pulled out of the square root and turns into the letter I for imaginary number. So we get plus or minus I and then times the square root of 11. I like to put my I in front of the square root. So that way it's very clear that the I is not inside the square root. But conventionally, um, when this gets entered in, the, a lot of these systems actually prefer to have the I in the back. So when you're entering it into Alex, just be careful that you're outside of your square root symbol before you type the I. So when you need to pay attention, because let's say you're typing on Alex, if it looks like this, this is not the same as the square root of 11 and then the i. So you have to pay attention to where that line is extending for the square root. Does 
because if it's above the eye, that means the eye is inside the square root and it needs to be outside of the square root. So when you're entering stuff, I, I get a lot of things from students that are like, I have the right answer and it marked it wrong. And it's because they had their eye or something inside the square root. Technically what they wrote was wrong. Um, you really need to pay attention to how far is that line above going because anything that that line above is, is like anything it's above is inside the square root. So if you don't want it to be inside, you have to make sure it's outside by hitting your arrow key before you type it. And it's the same thing when you're writing it down on paper. If the line is not above it, it's not inside it. So you want to be very careful when you're writing your work that your lines for square roots are over everything that's in the square root. Because if you get messy with that, then it starts to get confusing for people because then we don't know what's inside and what's outside. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip this one on the left because it is basically kind of the same as what we just did. I'm going to do the one on the right here. So this is one of the more complicated ones where you may want to do a substitution, but you don't have to. So we've got, instead of just like x squared or t squared, we have something in parentheses squared but we have something squared equals a number, so we can still take the square to both sides to solve. So the steps are the same, even though it looks different. So we've got the square root part by itself, which means your next step is to take the square to both sides. So I'm actually going to re rewrite it so that way I can do that in a different color. And watch how I'm making sure that my square root symbol is going over everything that I'm taking the square root of. So it needs to go over the whole thing in parentheses, including that exponent of 2. Now that square root now is canceling out the exponent and we're left with what's in parentheses p minus five. And then we always get a plus or minus and then we have our square root of nine. And your next step is you can take the square root of nine, which is three. So we have p minus five equals plus or minus three. So this is different than the other situations where we have, because we don't have just p by itself. We have p minus 5 and then a plus or minus 3. So there, there's basically two things, that, two different ways that you can write what you do from here. So we could solve for p by adding 5 to both sides, but what happens is it starts to get confusing with the plus or minus 3, because this plus or minus 3 is I can't just add 5 to 3 because it means two different numbers. This means positive 3, but it also means negative 3. And adding 5 to negative 3 won't give me the same answer as adding 5 to positive 3. So you don't want to just write plus 5 and then do 5 plus 3 because that's it's not going to give you the right answer. So you have to rewrite this as two separate equations so you can finish solving. And this is the best way to avoid any potential errors with your signs because this is one of the things that like where people make mistakes is they add five and then they get eight and then they say the answer is plus or minus eight because it's not. So we've got P minus five equals the positive version. So positive three, but we also have P minus five equals negative three. 
So we have two separate equations here to solve. And while the steps for solving are the same, we're still going to add 5 to both sides. You're going to get two very different answers. So next step is to then solve. So I'm going to add 5. And for my first answer, I get 8. But when I add 5 to the second one, we get 2. So you don't get the same number plus or minus. You have two different numbers here when you're solving an equation like this. They're not the same number at all. We have 8 and 2. So we can't even write it with a plus or minus as a shortcut. We have to write them as two separate numbers because they're not the same number. So it doesn't matter whether you do 2 comma 8 or 8 comma 2. That part doesn't matter but you would have to write them separated by a comma when you put them in your solution set. So they're, they're two distinct answers, two very different answers to the same equation. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, so do we always have to break it into two separate equations if that is the initial equation has the parentheses is that what is that what's making us have yes okay yes because we have instead of just the the variable by itself we have something added or subtracted to that variable and that's what's causing us to now have to do the plus or minus okay so yeah so if you have something in parentheses and it's not just the letter always do the two separate equations okay thank you that is an excellent question. Are there other questions? OK, so here we're getting it more complicated and now I'm having a single <laughs> thing by itself because it's going to take more steps. So again, we, we've got something in parentheses. So this is where we're going to want to have to write it as two separate equations. And actually, I should put that in my steps here. So when the form involves parentheses, basically. So it's like something, something squared. If you've got that, then that's when you're going to have to rewrite it as two separate equations. So I'll make sure I put that in my directions. So we need to get our square root by its or square root. The square, the part I'm highlighting, we need to get this part by itself before we can take square roots. You do not want to take the square root at this point because then you're going to get half to take it's it's square roots of things with plus and minus don't really work well like inside them. So I need to add five to both sides. So step one, get, make sure I'm in my pen. Is so the shortcut to saying get the square root by itself or the square by itself is is the word isolate isolate the square. So we just isolate. I mean, it's like if you're in an isolation, you're by yourself. So we just use that instead of get it by itself, but get it by itself is like the everyday term. So, but isolate is shorter here. So I'm going to write isolate. So I need to add the five to both sides of this equation. And so that is going to give me, uh, if I'm in the right color, <laughs> we have the parentheses part, 3x minus 2 squared and then equal to 5. And now that we have the squared on itself, by itself on the left, doesn't matter if it's on the left or right, but it's by itself, now you're going to take the square root of both sides. 
Okay, and I got a question. Why don't we plus or minus five? Is that for the adding five to both sides or is that for the square step here? We don't do any plus or minus until after we've done the square root. And uh, for minus, we have a minus five, so we always do the opposite of the sign. So since it's a minus, we wanted to use a plus sign to get it on the other side. Okay, you jumped the gun. <laughs> okay, I was, I was thinking, I'm like, wait, I think you're ahead of the game. <laughs> but I thought, just in case. So we're taking the square root of something squared, so that cancels out. We're left with just what was inside the parentheses, and now we're going to have a plus or minus, and then the square root of 5. So um, in this case, if you're having the plus or minus of a square root, and we cannot take the square root of 5, 5 is prime, we could shortcut into using one equation with a plus or minus symbol. But again, it can get a little confusing. So we will split this into two equations. So we will write as two equations. And so, I'll just use kind of, I like to use arrows to indicate, you know, the what I'm doing here, that I've, I've split these up. And so we have 3x minus 2 equals the square root of 5, and 3x minus 2 equals the negative square root of 5. So I've written these as two separate equations. And this is the same thing that you do when you solve um, absolute value equations, because the absolute value always makes something positive. If you put a negative inside an absolute value, it becomes positive. And a positive inside of an absolute value is positive. So there's two solutions to absolute value equations. And so you solve quadratics and you get like a plus or minus thing. It's same thing with absolute value. You're gonna, you don't get a plus or minus, but you still get two equations. So it kind of operates the same th same way. And let me see what I'm trying to remember if we're doing absolute values this week or if that's next week. So. I, um, ah, oh, that was last week. Okay. I get so confused because I teach two different algebra classes and everything is in a different order. So, so last week we did the absolute value equations. And so you can see that this is similar, that we're having two, two equations here. So now I need to solve each of these equations. And my screen only holds so much, so I have to rewrite these on another slide. So we've got our 3x minus 2 equal the square root of 5. 3x minus 2 equals negative square root of 5. And technically, you have the word or between there because the word and would imply that these two answers are true at the same time. They're not. One is true at one time or the other one is true, you can't have two answers that you can plug in at the same time into the equation. So it's it, I, I will say and because we have this equation and that equation, but the and just means that we have two equations. They're not true at the same time. A mathematical and means at the same time. So it's technically a mathematical or, which is different from English or. So just to clarify that, because sometimes um, some textbooks or whatever can get very particular about whether you write or or and. Math has different meanings for or and and than English does, and so I just wanted to make sure that's clear. Um, here this is the English or, but we do have two equations, so this and that. So solving, when you're solving, you're doing the same steps on both sides. So 
I'm adding two because I need to do that first. And I can work both of these equations at the same time. And that's actually what I like to do. I like to work them both at the same time. So you may be wondering, well, how do you write your answer when you have a number plus a square root? Because we don't actually, we can't add those. We're not going to turn the square root into a decimal and then add the numbers. So what we do is we usually put the number first, so 2, and then we've got a positive square root, so we'd write 2 plus the square root of 5. So we don't actually add them, we just literally write what we're doing here. And for the other one, it would be 3x equals, you put your number first, and then we have minus the square root of 5. So, because the, they're not technically like terms, you can make the square root of 5 a decimal, then you can add them, but we're writing the exact answer, so we don't want to do any rounding, we don't want to put it on the calculator, so we're just going to literally write what we're seeing here. Then we are still solving for x, so we need to divide both sides by 3. So when this happens, we're dividing everything by 3. So it's not just you're writing, you're dividing the 2, you're dividing the 2 and the square root of 5 portions by 3 everything is getting divided by 3. So we're getting fractions here. So we have x equals 2 thirds plus, and then it's totally fine to write the square root of 5 over 3. That's completely okay. We're fine with square roots on tops of fractions. We just don't want them in the bottom. And then on the right, we have x equals 2 thirds minus the square root of 5 over 3. Now, if you do get the identical same thing like we have here, but they only differ by a sign, we can combine them into one answer, 2 thirds plus or minus the square root of 5 over 3, because that's the only difference between them, is that sign. So if you wanted to, you could combine them back together with a plus or minus. Now another way you could rewrite this is instead of having square root of 5 over 3, you could write this as 2 thirds and then do 1 third times the square root of 5. That is also an equivalent way to write your answer. So um, there, are, when you have things with fractions, you can write your answers in multiple ways. These are all valid ways to write the answer. And I would recommend, and you'll see this in Alex, is if it tends to be a situation that involves square roots, they will give you that plus or minus button. And so I would recommend utilizing that when you write your answer so that you don't have to retype everything and write your answer using the plus or minus in between where the only difference is. Otherwise, you would have to write the same thing, comma, you'd have 2 thirds plus the square root of 5 over 3, comma, 2 thirds minus the square root of 5 over 3. And that takes a lot to type in and it's easier to make mistakes. So I would recommend if you notice that they're exactly the same except for the signs, you can combine those as that plus or minus. The other option is to literally copy what you wrote, paste it in, and then change the sign to a minus. But you have to be careful that you don't forget to actually change the sign when you do that. Are there questions? Okay, I have one here with a fraction because I know people hate fractions <laughs> and it can get tricky dealing with square roots and fractions and 
um, all of that. So I thought I'm going to go over an example where you have fractions involved. So that way you kind of see what the whole process is. So this form is basically the same form as the other one that we did. We've got something squared. Uh, we've got plus a number here equal to zero. So we need to isolate our square. So it's the same form as our last example. It's just got fractions involved. So step one, isolate the square. And I always like to highlight when you've got something that looks complicated so that you know what you're trying to get by itself. And you're like, this block I need to get by myself by itself. And so I'm not going to touch that. I'm only going to touch anything I didn't highlight. So we're going to subtract the 7 fourths from both sides. Oops. And so I've got x minus 3 halves squared equals negative 7 fourths. So I've got my square part by itself, and it's equal to a negative. So we're going to get some complex numbers out of here. We're going to get imaginary numbers. And so just, just follow along. <laughs> just follow along so you have a guide here. So step two is to take the square root. So when I take the square root on the left, it's going to cancel out the square. And then I've got this square root on the right with the negative. So I've got x minus 3 halves equals plus or minus and then I have the square root of negative 7 over 4. Before we go any further we need to simplify that square root. So first I've got a negative in there I'm going to pull out the letter i to make it imaginary. So x minus 3 halves equals plus or minus i and I always curve my i's just to make it look, I don't know, so I don't get confused, I and a dot, I don't know, I just always curve it. And then we've got the square root of 7 over 4. Now we still need to simplify this fraction that's in the square root. So the square root of the top, square root of 7, that gives us a decimal and 7's prime, so we cannot simplify that. But we can take the square root of 4, which is in the denominator. So we get x minus 3 halves equals plus or minus i. I have the square root of 7, and then the square root of 4 is 2. So that's just a 2 in the denominator. So now that I've simplified that square root, now we want to rewrite this as our two separate equations so that you can kind of follow along, see what's going on. And we've got this i, we've got the square root, and you know, it looks very complicated. It's not as bad as it seems. So I'm gonna have to go into my next slide here. So we're gonna rewrite as two equations. So I have x minus 3 halves equals i times the square root of 7 over 2. x minus 3 halves equals, and, and the negative will go in front of the i. And then the i square root of 7 over 2. So make sure the negative is in front of the i, because otherwise it will look like subtraction. Step four is to solve. 
So I need to add 3 fourths to both sides because I've got x minus 3 fourths. I need the x by itself. And so I do the same thing on both equations. Said 3 fourths, I mean 3 halves. <laughs> I don't know where I got the four. There's no four here. So I have x equals, and then we put the number. So the three halves is not a match. It's not a like term with the thing with the i and the square root. So these are going to be written separately. So we put the number first, three halves. Then I have a positive with the i. And then the square root of 7 over 2. And then our second answer, we have that 3 halves first, and then we have minus i square root of 7 over 2. And you can see that these are the same, but they just differ by that sign of 1's plus, 1's minus, but everything else is the same. So then we can combine them back into the plus or minus version. And so let's use that. So when you enter your answer, you'd have your 3 halves, then you'd have your plus or minus. And then when you're entering this into Alex, it's good to put the i in the back. And you want to make sure it's not part of the, the square root. So you have to just make sure where you have everything um, put in place. You know, you don't want the i to be inside the square root. So you can make it outside of the fraction. If you're wondering about typing this up, I would... If trying to type the square root of 7 over 2 and then the i, what I would do is first hit the square root button, then in the top of the square, or not the square root button, hit the fraction button first to get your fraction set up. Then on the top of the fraction, do your square root, put in your number, do the number in the denominator, and then get outside of the fraction and hit the i. So I would put the fraction in first if you're trying to type this so that everything goes where it needs to go in the correct order. So the steps here are basically the same steps that we did on the previous example. We just had fractions, which meant a little bit more simplifying when we took the square root part. But after that, it was basically the same thing. I mean, we don't even really need to worry about adding the fractions because of the square roots and the i's. Same thing here. We didn't have to add these fractions together. So it's almost easier than really dealing with fractions because you don't need to combine them because they're not like terms. Are there any questions? Um, I actually do have a question. Go right ahead. Um, what, what's the rule, what's the mathematical rule that allows us to take um, 7 over 2 or the square root of 7 over 2 and split it up into square root of 7 over the square root of 2. You mean this, this square root is uh, 7 over 4 here? Yeah, yeah, sorry, that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so there is a rule that allows you to do this. And I don't remember the name of the rule. Let me open up. The textbook to find where that rule is but basically um, it's it's like when you learned about exponents so a square root is actually the same as a one-half power and there is a rule it's the quotient rule of exponents that says that the outside power distributes to the insides and so that's basically the same thing that we're doing with the square root. It's just we're writing, we have a different symbol for the square root versus its exponent form. But it's really just following the rules of exponents here that allow you to take whatever is on the outside and apply it to what's on the inside. So I'm opening up the textbook right now to see where they've put that rule. Okay, so they're calling it the quotient property. It's in section 
I am currently scrolling to find it. Um, you know, the, so the textbook doesn't actually explicitly give you the rule. It explains it in terms of the exponents like I did here. So they don't actually say, hey, this is what the rule is, but that's what the rule is. <laughs> so <laughs> I can see where if you were following the textbook, you might, you'd, you'd miss that because they don't really, ah, here it is. Okay, I found it. Actually, let me pull this over. Here, this is this is the rule that we're doing right here, but we're taking the right side and moving to the left versus the left side to the right side. So this is in section 3.1. So that that's it's a very nice rule. It allows you to take things with fractions inside, and then you can simplify things a little bit further if you have a number that you can take the square root of. So does that help answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. It's easy to miss these things. <laughs> I mean, even though I'm like, where is it? I'm sure it's somewhere in here. Are there other questions? Okay, so we are running out of time. So I'm going to do one example with the perfect square trinomial. And so that you can see that that's the last form that we haven't really talked about where you can factor first if it's a perfect square trinomial. And then you can use the rules. So it's only this, this specific case. And so you have to look on your left side and recognize that it is the form. So this is a perfect square trinomial. And so you have to look at it. And if you know you're factoring really well, then you can say, ah, it's in this form. So I can factor this left side and then do the square root. But I'll be honest, um, most of the time, I mean, it's very rare for it to be a perfect square trinomial. And most of the time, even if it is, I'm not going to do this method. So I'm just going to show it to you because you can use this method. But I usually end up using the quadratic formula instead. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of up to what you recognize. And if you recognize this, then you can go and solve this way. I usually don't even bother. But let's say you did recognize that this is a perfect square trinomial. So your first step is then to factor the left side. And so I'm not going to go into how to factor the perfect square trinomials. I'm just going to write the answer. It is x plus 6, the quantity squared. So you can go back to the book about factoring these. Perfect square trinomials are one of the factors that I, I don't think it's super important to remember how to do because there are other methods. Like you use the quadratic formula here instead. So um, I'm just showing it to you, but you don't have to use this method. But if you do, you factor it and you see you've got, oh, something squared equals one, and it's already got the square by itself, so we can take the square to both sides. And so that gives us x plus 6. We got plus or minus the square root of 1. And the square root of 1 is just 1. So we have x plus 6 equals plus or minus 1. So now we need to rewrite as two equations. And that's because we had something in parentheses. And so we have x plus 6 equals 1, x plus 6 equals negative 1, 
and I'm going to see if I can squeeze this in. This is, is they give me more black space on your screen than what I actually have on my screen that I'm writing down. <laughs> so we would subtract six from both sides. And so one minus six is negative five. Negative one minus six is negative seven. So we get two answers here that I'm squeezing in. Negative five, negative seven. So the perfect square trinomial, if you recognize that it's not a lot of steps here, and this is actually fewer steps than doing the quadratic formula, because the quadratic formula can literally take up an entire page. It's a lot of steps. They're, you're very prone to making mistakes with your signs. And so if you recognize something like this, it is quicker. But it's all about recognizing that it's in this particular form. And like I said, to be honest, I don't even bother. I usually just do the quadratic formula. But I wanted to show you that you can do this. It's, it's like a little math trick that if you're really advanced at math or, you know, if you see these little tricks, you can speed things up for you. But it's not required. And sometimes the, the tried and true method of quadratic formula works every time. So it's like, you know, I use the method that works rather than trying to find shortcuts sometimes. So are there any questions on this example? Actually, I have a, a real quick question. And sure. it's, it's it's about the perfect square trinomial. I, I feel like I've okay. been overthinking it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so are you pretty much just taking the square root of, let's say, in this example, 36? Like if you have the x squared in the front and the 36 in the back, you're pretty much taking the square root of the 36 and then making this uh, x plus 6 all squared? Yes. And you know it's a perfect square trinomial because the middle term has to be those two things multiplied, multiplied together and doubled. So you've got the square root of x, which is, or a square root of x squared, which is x, the square root of 36, which is 6. You multiply those, you get 6x, double, you get 12x. So if the double, if that matches your middle, if your middle is double those two things multiplied together, then it's a perfect square trinomial. And once it's in that form, yes, you literally just take the square to the first number and the last number, and that's how you get your form. Okay, thank you, because oh, I have been, yeah. I guess, in my in my mind, I've been making that so much more difficult than it needed to be. <laughs> like, I have this one, which I'm not going to go over the whole process here, because we don't have a lot of time, but this one's also a perfect square trinomial, a lot harder to recognize. But the square root of 4x squared would be 2x, and the square root of 81 would be... 9, and then because the middle is minus, you'd have a minus there. And then you just need to double check. 2 times 9 is 18. 18 times 2 is 36. So it matches that middle term, and so that makes it a perfect square trinomial. It's just, it's a lot harder to recognize in this form. Like, if I saw something like this, for sure I'd use the quadratic formula. I would be like, yeah, no. <laughs> So if there are no other questions, um, so like I said, sorry, I usually try to get interaction, but um, my dog was barking, so I thought, oh, I better make it quick, and then this actually ended up going a lot longer than I was sort of planning, so there not really was room for more interaction like we've done in the past. Just to give you guys a heads up, and I'm going to send an email about this tomorrow, I am going to be on vacation during week four, so Wednesday through Tuesday. Um, so we're, we're going to have, there, there is going to be somebody covering, doing the discussions, all of that stuff, someone for you to email. I'll still be sending stuff via Remind. I'm going to set up all of my announcements. Um, I'll be occasionally checking my email, though not regularly responding because I'll be on vacation. But I just want to give you guys a heads up. So um, I'm, you know, now that I'm finally vaccinated fully, <laughs> two weeks out from my second shot,
I'm going to be visiting my family, which I haven't seen since December 2019, which I'm sure you guys are, a lot of you are in the same boat, haven't seen family in forever. Um, I'm actually going to be babysitting my niece, who is 14 months old, because her daycare shut down because one of the kids got COVID. So now my um, sister and brother-in-law are working from home and trying to take care of her. And I'm like, oh, I'm finally vaccinated. I can be your babysitter for a week. So that's what I'm going to be doing during my vacation is giving them a week off so they can actually work while the daycare is closed down. So, um, but just, I'm going to send an email about this with all the contact information of who's going to be covering for me during that week, just so that you guys know you'll be in good hands. So I'm not worried. Um, because I'll be on vacation, I won't be doing a live next Sunday, but if I have time, I'm going to try to pre-record something to email out. So depends on how much time I have trying to get everything set up before I go, but I just wanted to give you that heads up. So, um, do you guys have any, any questions on anything, any other stuff? All right, so thank you for attending, hanging out with me for this hour, um, sticking through the solving by square roots, which can get pretty complicated. Just as an FYI, the book does talk about completing the square. You are not gonna be asked to complete the square on any quiz or test. So while it is in the reading, you will not have to do it. So just as an FYI, don't freak out about that. We're not going to ask you to complete the square. So uh, that's something that a lot of people really get confused on. So that should be a breath of relief. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go. I hope you guys have a great evening and I'll see you when I come back from my vacation, basically. <laughs> so <laughs> take care.